It's really great to have you here. I'm so happy we met in Venice at Venice Cocktail Week, and I can't wait to hear the backstory about Altamora Vodka and Altamora Distillery. So Frank, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about you? Sure, it's great to be here, and it was definitely a great meeting in, in Venice. Um, let's see, uh, just way background. I'm originally from New York City, born and raised to an Italian-American family. Um, grew up there, went to high school and college in Manhattan, so really a, a you know, born and bred New Yorker. But shortly after graduating um, college, I moved to the southern part of the U.S., Jackson, Mississippi. Um, actually worked for a company that was uh, then named LDDS, and I forecasted that it meant long drive down south, because being a New Yorker, I had no idea where Mississippi was. I knew it was a river. I didn't know it was a state. Um, but, uh, but I spent the- Oh my God, I, I love that. that. <laughs> it's, it's actually kind of true. Um, I spent the majority of my adult life in the south, actually. Um, I lived in Atlanta for a long time, um, uh, to, to, uh, Mississippi for 13 years, Atlanta twice, um, and with a short stint in Colorado. So I've kind of tr been around. Um, but I've always loved Italy, grew up, as I said, in a very Italian-American household um, uh, with uh, deep roots in Italian culture, Italian food. Um, my favorite place to travel was Italy, and I always wanted to move to Italy. There, there's a little bit of that. Um, I always wanted to move to Italy, and so, um, you know, working as a marketing consultant in Atlanta in the middle of COVID, locked down in, uh, in my apartment, it kind of hit me, what are we waiting for? Um, and that's when the idea to, to just to move now came came to me. Now, now going back to your Italian heritage and your eating and drinking, were there certain things that you remember that your family always ate and drank that you loved? Yeah. So, you know, my, my, both my mom and my grandmother were, were really amazing cooks. Um, like I said, very, very authentic Italian American hustle. But, you know, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday dinner was really Sunday lunch. It started somewhere around two and didn't end until six or seven in the evening. Um, you know, their pastas were amazing. I grew up eating lots of veg vegetarian pastas because that's what my mom loved to cook. But um, I have one particular dish that if I, if I get it, it reminds me of being a kid. And it's, it's a fried eggplant hero because my grandmother knew I loved those. And when I, whenever she, she would fry them up and leave, leave me a sandwich on the kitchen counter for me to come home and just pick up and eat. And it like, if I get just a fried eggplant on just a piece of a loaf of Italian bread with a little olive oil on it, it's like going back to being a kid. Now, how about drinking? Well, you know, again, where, where being a have... very Italian household, uh, I was drinking wine with Coca-Cola at a very young age. So I, <laughs> I grew up very much in a red wine, uh, you know, red wine kind of family. My uncle made his own wine. Um, uh, it's a little tough to drink. The Coke definitely helped it. Um, but but uh, so very much wine. Um, and then, you know, things like Sambuca. It's so funny living here now. It's like whenever I see Sambuca, I'm like, oh, my God, it's like back to family dinners because at the end of every meal, you know, there was a espresso on the table and a bottle of Sambuca. So that's definitely a trigger. But definitely red wine, what I, what I would say, was the, the crux of what we drank uh, as I was growing up. And was there, when you thought about moving to Italy, was there a specific place that you had in mind? You know, it's interesting, n no. Um, I, and I live in Puglia, but I've never traveled to Puglia before moving here. Um, Justin, my, my spouse and I have traveled Italy a lot, along with Steve, my best friend and partner in the business. Um, but we'd never been to Puglia. But when we were thinking about where to move, um, we definitely wanted the best weather options in, in Italy. So that kind of drove us to the south beaches, good airport access because we all love to travel. And pretty quickly, Puglia rose to the top of the, the likely list. I do love Sicily, and Sicily was a strong consideration, but it's a little bit remote unless you live Catania or Palermo. You know, the airports are a bit far apart. The island is beautiful, though, and the weather is obviously amazing. Puglia has the benefit of two airports really close together, so it's really easy to travel here. The weather's fantastic. Beautiful beaches, great food. So it, it checked a lot of boxes. So we definitely were gravitating towards the south. I mean, I love the big cities in, in Italy, and I love traveling to them. But for where to live, we wanted beach and warm weather, and, and, uh, and, and that, that really headed us down this way. So you know what's funny is that you um, were were destined to go down south again yeah. <laughs> after being in the U.S. down south. Yeah, and I should say my my f family background is all Southern Italian too. My my father's family um, is all Sicilian from one town in Sicily named Lakata, 
where both my great-grandfather and great-grandmother were born. And then my mom's family is split between Calabria and Campania, so Naples and the area around Reggio Calabria. So no Pugliese directly, but definitely all in the general vicinity of Puglia. It was meant yeah, to be. Yeah, I think it definitely now, was meant to be. <laughs> now, Altamora. So w when you got there, did you start the distillery, or was it something that you thought of beforehand? It, it, because you said you were in marketing, so not really in the drinks industry. No, no, no. I, my, my, my partner in the business, Steve Acuna, and I were our marketing consultants, and, and that you know, we, when we originally started the moving plant, the plan to move here, we just said we'd do our consulting gig, just do it from the south of Italy instead of the south of the United States. Uh, but I love to cook. I got that from my mom and my, my grandmother. And, and so when we made the decision to move to Puglia, I, you know, I, I, obviously Italy's got very regionally centric um, dishes. And so I said, let me just have some fun cooking some Pugliese recipes, um, you know, orecchietti, which I made at and bombetti and things like that. And that's when I found the recipe for Pana del Demora. Um, and like every every home cooking American in COVID, I had a sourdough starter. So I'm like, I can do this. So I, I baked it and, you know, understood the history of the bread. So I'll just, you know, br briefly, it's the only bread in the world that has a PDO. Um, so just like uh, prosciutto de Parma has to be made in, in Parma and champagne can only be labeled champagne if it's produced in, in actually the region of champagne. Uh, Pera del Monte Altamora has to be made in the city of Altamora. There are actually only a dozen bakeries left that bake it to the exacting standards of the PDO. And it has to be made from wheat that is raised in Altamora or one of the neighboring common areas. It's like the, the PDO looks very much like the PDO for uh, Barolo. Um, Bar Barolo has grapes have to be grown, uh, you know, in the neighboring common areas also. And so that, you know, I started, I baked the bread and it was really good. And then you st I start looking at it saying, you know, a loaf of bread is nothing more than a bottle of vodka or bourbon or, or gin waiting to happen. And that's what got me looking, and nobody was distilling anything from Altamoran wheat. And it's a very unique wheat. The wheat's over, you know, the strains are like 2,000 years old. The poet Horace wrote about Palma de Altamora in 37 BCE and said, if you're a wise traveler, you'll carry some loaves. It's baked with a very thick outer crust, and because it's a hard wheat, it lasts longer, so it doesn't go stale very quick. So it's... So that's what happened is when we made, once we decided to move to Puglia, I found out the bread baked it, said, Steve, why don't we open a distillery? You know, we both love to drink, but neither one of us ever distilled anything before, and we went for it. So uh, we actually started the business even before we moved to Italy. You, it's crazy. Yeah, that's so, a good word um, for it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I meant it's, no. no. <laughs> I mean, I eat bread all the time. I never think about, Oh, well, let me create a, you know, a vodka from this wheat. Now, again, sorry if I get confused, but you were making the Altamora bread before you even got to Puglia? Yeah, because I was, I was just cooking Pugliese recipe in, recipes in Atlanta just to kind of like, what's the food like? And uh, you could buy, you can buy Altamora wheat in the U.S. You have to go to a, spe that yeah, was my you question. Have to go to a specialty shop. Um, and you will find some specific, you know, Altamore flour. It's actually, you know, ground already, so it's flour. It's a very, it's, it's, it's semolina, it's durum wheat. Um, so it's very yellow and coarse and, you know, different than soft white wheat. And, and, and you know, Altamore wheat just happens to be very specific. It's certain strains of wheat and they have been unchanged across almost 2,000 years. So, uh, but yeah, so I could bake, I could bake it. I, I, legally, it wasn't pounded Altamore because it wasn't made in Altamore. Right, of course. But I did a pretty good right. fake job. <laughs> <laughs> so when you think, I, I mean, were you, so you were just going to really start work from like work at an American company while you were living in Italy? Yeah. Most of our clients are, that was the yeah, plan. Most of our clients are large okay. size U S companies. And so they don't, they're, we're consultants. So they don't really particularly care where we are as long as we show up to the meetings. So that was the original plan. So, and then you, you eat the bread, you think wheat. You go, okay, let's make some vodka. Now, the, how was the process of starting that company while you were still in the UK? I mean, the, sorry, no, in right. the US? So st I'll, I'll break it into two parts. Starting it before, while we were still in the US, that was not the, the all we really did was like form the legal company. Um, we found a really helpful commercialista. Uh, accountant for uh, non-Italians um, here in Puglia who helped us form the company. We got connected with a really great advertising agency in Bari who are, you know, some of our best friends now to help us, you know, create the logo. Um, we could talk about the logo and get all that going. So that wasn't so hard because it's, you know, just this, this easy stuff of forming a company. Actually getting here and getting the license 
to produce and sell alcohol. Um, <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm not sure. Well, I'd love to hear yeah, some can, of that. Yeah, so. that, that was coming up against right. the bureaucracy that is Italy. <laughs> All right. I know it sounds so easy from the beginning when you said we found a, an accountant, we found this. You know, I guess you already had made some friends down down in the ground, on the ground, yes. should I say, in Puglia before coming. Yeah, we had started to network socially and made some business contacts and um, you know, I talked to some folks that were already living here. So we did some, some free networking and got, got, got the basics of the business started, but we really didn't, you know, start to get deeply into producing the vodka until after we moved, which was May of uh, May of last year. Okay. So you moved, mm -hmm. you settle, you find a place, you're settled. I see you're sitting in a house or in an apartment. Um, did you still keep thinking this was a good idea? Yeah. I mean, so the mean, well, moving to Italy was a great idea. Starting a distillery yeah. still seemed like a fun thing to do because I hadn't. We it hadn't did. Banged, That's what I yeah, meant. Yeah, we hadn't banged our heads against the wall that is the Italian bureaucracy yet. <laughs> right. That happened yet. pretty quickly. Um, pretty quickly after that, we we got okay. We've got this business form now. We need permission to. Uh, initially, we contract distilled, but we still we needed we still needed the permission to import and sell our our vodka under our logo. So we needed all of those, all of that licensing ability and. It's not like Italy's a big distilling country, especially especially when it comes to truly hard spirits, right? Yeah, I, I you know listen to some of your podcasts and you talk about some of the products that come here for like Amaros and things like that. Italy's famous for that, but not the high proof stuff that we were making. Uh -huh. And so, um, going through the process of getting the permission, uh, I would voluntarily sign up sign up to have all all of my teeth removed with root canal without <laughs> Novocaine, rather than go through that again. <laughs> All right. But you did it and you got out the other side, which is great. But my question, another question is um, the wheat. How did you uh, know or did you know before you left that you were actually able to buy uh, this wheat to use it for It's vodka? a fantastic story. So, again, Italy's a lovely country of people, right? And if you get to know people, that's the way stuff happens. So, so we, we connect, uh, I, we decided that we needed an ad Italian advertising agency that we wanted the brand to be authentically Italian. We didn't want to be a bunch of Americans come over and, and make it Americanized, right? So we really wanted the brand to reflect Puglia, Altamora. And so we, we chose that we said we're going to get an Italian ad agency and we sent a bunch of requests out. <laughs> Only one agency replied and they're, they're based in Bari um, and Altamora is in, in the province of, of Bari. Um, and they, the guys fall in love with it. They're wonderful, and they help us design the logo. And then they say, oh, have you found out how to get wheat yet? And we're like, well, no. We, you know, we figure we, we'll find out how to buy wheat. Well, one of their other clients was in Altamora, and she was the daughter of a farmer who raises wheat. And they said, would you like us to connect you with, with these people? And I'm like, ah, this would be genius. So we did, and we started communicating with them even before we moved. And literally a week after we landed here, Steve and I got in a car and drove to Altamora. Um, it's a really funny story. Steve's driving. We get into Altamora, and we're looking for a place to park. And there are these two, uh, you know, slightly older gentlemen, and and they're clearly like guarding a space. But we try to pull into it, and they start to say, "No, you can't park here." But then Steve rolls the window down. And they look in, and they go, "Grillo?" And I'm like, "Yeah." It was Mr. Capiello <laughs> waiting for us, guarding a space outside his apartment. And so we, they've been, we've been adopted members of the Capiello family ever since then. Um, as a matter of fact, they are coming here. The whole family's coming here for lunch on Saturday because we kind of have this tradition of every six months we go there and they come here. And so we got hooked up with a wheat supplier even before we moved here just by them being basically friends of friends. Now, to think up a vodka or, or any distillery and to actually produce the liquid that goes inside the bottle. And we will talk about mm -hmm. the bottle design and everything in a sec um, are way, are way two different things. Um, so how, did you know, you know, recipe, uh, how much wheat you would need all of that? If you both are marketers, did you have a distiller? Were you big vodka drinkers? <laughs> See, I told you, I asked a lot of no, questions at once, all those things. We're big drinkers. Steve's the bigger vodka drinker than me, though. Honestly, after after Venice Cocktail Week, I've been drinking martinis like they're water. I actually have actually have one right here. <laughs> but but um, 
Well, so, I mean, I, I know a lot about distilling personally because I'm really interested in it, but we hired a distillery master um, right away. Um, uh, he, um, his name is Carlos Andres Perez. Um, he's actually Honduran, but he has a master's degree in distilling from Harriet Watton University in Edinburgh, Scotland. I think the only place in the world oh. where you can get a master's degree in distilling. And so we quick, I mean, I, you know, Steve and I had a vision for what we wanted, but Carlos was the one who really translated the vision into the mash idea um, and, and then and went on from there. And so he's, he's, we were actually in the process of producing our first gin. He's the one who came up with that recipe. So we pretty quickly said we need somebody who's got the real knowledge of the technical parts of distilling. Um, what we knew we wanted was to, uh, exp and it's interesting, I use this word, I've been using this word and more and more people have said it's a great word to use in spirits because it's mostly used in wine. We wanted to express the terroir of Altamora, right? The purpose for the vodka uh, was to express the, we I like to say, we just wanted to take the bread and let you be able to drink it instead of eat it, right? So how do we express uh -huh. all of the lovely, all of the lovely uh, wheat and that comes through in the bread in a liquid format? And so it was really important that the vodka we produced still respected and reflected the terroir of Altamora just like the bread did. And so we, we knew that was our idea for it, that we wanted the wheat to be present, not to be a six, seven, eight time distilled vodka that strips everything out. And so we gave Carlos that mission uh, to work with the, our distilling partner to come up with that, with that recipe. And, and about how long did it take? Uh, that was probably a four month process of, of testing uh, to come up with the right flavor profile. And um, so then the amount of wheat, you know, when the, when your, your gentleman farmer um, said, okay, you know, you could have said, well, we want like all of your wheat. I mean, did, was it tons and tons? Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's, a, it's about, um, uh, we're going to check this afterwards, but it's about 900, 90 kilos per bottle of, of vodka. Uh, it's a less efficient wheat than soft wheat because hard wheat doesn't break uh -huh. down as easily. So it's a more expensive product to produce because of that, but not exceptionally so. And Altamore is huge. So uh, we, we, we were like, how much wheat could we get? And he's like, you, you've got a long way to go to worry me. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we, but, but yeah, so, and you know, he, we have an exclusive agreement with him. His name is Andrea Capiello and he's just a lovely, lovely person. And we know his whole family. Um, and he's like, look, I, right. have, I, you know, he raises so much wheat. Um, it's a lot, it's a, it's a double growing season because the weather here is really conducive. So it's not, they, they can raise, a, grow a lot of wheat. I guess you grow wheat. Anyway, so uh, we're not constrained um, by a wheat supply yet. I, I, I really want that to be my problem, Susan. <laughs> I want to come back to you one day and say, remember that question? It turned out to be an issue, but right now we're not constrained just yet. And now we've taken over all of Puglia and everything. They're not making the no bread anymore bread, yes. because there's so much weight. <laughs> there's so much, there's so much uh, vodka. Um, so you have you have your liquid. Now you said that you thought of the bottle and um, its design and the, the label and all of that beforehand. Can you talk me through that? Sure. So well, like, yeah, yeah. So on. so. Uh... Cosmo and Giovanni, who are two, two uh, I, I, there are days that I, I say to Steve, I think they care about our brand more than we do. Uh, it's a real blessing to work with folks like that. Um, so but Cosmo in particular designed the label. So the first thing is there's a lion on the label. Um, uh, the reason for that is Altamura is the lioness of Puglia, but Italy is a bit of a machismo society. So um, uh, the, the, the front steps of the cathedral, the Catedrale in Altamura has two giant stone lions there. I don't know the exact story, but it goes back to Altamora withstanding an invasion from a Saracen army, and that's how it got. That's how it got its moniker of, of being a, a real uh, the lion or lioness of Puglia. So, uh, you know, Cosmo said we need to use the lion. It's so emblematic of of Altamora. Uh, and then the colors on the bottle are uh, very um, traditional Pugliese colors. They show up here in oh. in art. They show up here in clothing. They show up on the, the, the colors that things are painted. So the bottle really is a combination of reflection of Altamora proper in the lion and Puglia in its colors. And we wanted to be respectful, but also a bit modern, right? We wanted to say, hey, this is we're respecting the traditions of, of Italy and of Puglia, 
but with a contemporary take, right? We're not baking bread, we're making vodka. And so we wanted to get all of that across and a little bit, you know, I say this to Cosmo all the time, I, I'm a Fellini fan, right? We, we always want to convey la dolce vita in everything we do and, and, and give you that, you know, that sip of vodka will transport you to a beach in Italy. And I, that's what we were trying to get across in the, um, in the label, in the brand label, which is that lion, and then in the, in the vodka bottle itself. I love that the colors are uh, symbolic or, or, you know, represent Puglia, that this, this lovely green, pink, and, and gold. Yeah, yeah, and that's why our t-shirts are now in color. And, and this is the Jin logo, by the way. Um, so the Jin logo is the lion face, and his mane uh -huh. is all of the botanicals in our Jin. So we're, we're keeping the colors in. And you heard it the, now. And, the, and the, uh, you know, the lion is, a, is the heart of the brand. Uh -huh. Um, because they're so, by the way, the colors are so soft, mm -hmm. and you would kind of equate it with some place that is has a lot of sun, and um, you, you know they're they're lovely pale pale yeah. colors. Now, the bottle itself, how did you decide on this design or this type of bottle? Uh, you know, it's a it's a fairly classic vodka shape, right? And and we wanted mm -hmm. to we we you know we're as upstart a bit of an upstart brand, but, and we wanted to be easily identifiable as a vodka brand on the back bar. And that was our thinking, right? We're, we're going to have to earn our way, earn our way to the front of the bar. And so our bottle's going to be sitting on the back bar, and we want a customer to be able to look at it and say, that looks like vodka, and that's a really interesting label. Let me see it. So we wanted to make sure it was clear what the product was. That's a really traditional vodka shape. Um, and so we, it, and, and we wanted to stand out with the lion and the colors. So that was all of our thinking around the design of the, of the bottle itself. Fantastic. And now about using the vodka did you have any specific oh my god I love that's this. lucky i'm sorry for those of <laughs> you who are just listening to the podcast not watching this a snout a gorgeous furry snout just joined our, did the, <laughs> the video the video of this sorry he's 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 lucky as yes, thank you. a dog all right sure <laughs> and i'm a dog lover so i couldn't help no, but no, say all. something <laughs> he's my partner <laughs> uh, um, so back to the uh, the cocktails. So were there specific cocktails that you thought Altamora vodka has to work well in these cocktails? You, you, I would say without hesitation, the martini, right? It, it's the it's the pure reflection of vodka, the best pure reflection of vodka. And, and um, you know, that was when you think about tasting a vodka other than drinking it just neat if you know what's going to be the test of a vodka or of a, a good gin depending on your preference so definitely the martini was what we were thinking of from the from the out, the outset um and we i mean i'll say i just i love it. it it really loves vermouth um it's a vodka that like gives vermouth a big a big warm hug um and so it it really i think it makes a lovely martini but it is my my test case for it it's a it makes a, it, if you like it in a martini then you get it and were you thinking twist or olive um, or both? Yeah, so I, I'm more thinking wet versus dry. Um, so to me, it, it, I like a martini where the vermouth is is coming to the party. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with straight vodka, but it's not a martini to me, right? A martini is the blending of those flavors. Um, I will admit I'm more of an olive fan. Um, I like that little bit of brine in there, but I, I there, are, there are certainly nights when a twist just – looks right and i'll go for it so i can i can go both uh, you know if i if i were if i had one choice only it would be olive because i really like that little added touch of brine all right well back to but i i think i st i skipped ahead lucky threw me off for a second <laughs> but um so you back to your body you finally you have the liquid it's fabulous four months you've got it you've got it you have you start producing it it's great that you have it at your house, kind of like your uncle's um, wine, where everyone's enjoying it. And I'm sure your whole, everyone in Puglia was enjoying it. But what did you think were you're gonna be your next steps to getting it out to the world? Yeah, so you know, it, 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 we, everything took longer than we planned. Um, we actually didn't get, we didn't get <laughs> vodka in a bottle until, um, I've got fantastic stories around all of this, but uh, we didn't get vodka in a bottle until uh, mid-February of this year, even though we shipped the wheat in June of last year. To, by the time we got all the permissions, approvals, um, you know, get, finally got it distilled in the bottle, imported, brought, brought to a warehouse, a bonded warehouse, all of that. It, it took forever. Um, I, I, ha I came up with a saying in the middle of all of this because, you know, in the South especially, Siestas take place around 132. The whole 
the whole South shuts down, which is a very non-American way of doing business. So you really have this idea that you, you got till basically right at lunchtime to get something done. Uh, otherwise, drink a Negroni and try again tomorrow. And, and that really the way, <laughs> that's really the way we went through this whole process. Um, and, and finally, in February, the vodka shows up, and it's like, oh my God, it's finally real. And we do a, we did a really big and lovely launch party. It, it, it really worked very well. We had bartenders from uh, the Botanical Club in Milan. We had David DeFeria from Drink Kong in Rome. And then we had um, bartenders from uh, some important bars here in Puglia. And we did a kind of a contest of they each came up with their own cocktail. We invited mostly the trades and mostly people in hospitality. Um, you know, Puglia is a big vacation spot. So we had, you know, hotels, restaurants, bars. We launched the brand really well received. And, and you know, as you'd expect, Puglia gave us a big warm hug and we start selling in Puglia. And originally what we thought is, okay, you know, our, 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 we will start in Puglia, then we'll move through Italy. And then next year we'll think about where else to go. But what wound up happening is people started picking up on the story, you know, Americans move over, you know, never having distilled before. Look at this wheat. And the funny thing is the Pugliese kept saying, we live here. How do we miss this? And it's like, you know, I don't know. It's been here for 2,000 years. I, I, I don't know why nobody else chose to do this. Um, and so pretty quickly we got, you know, we, we made more contacts outside of Puglia, I think, than we did inside Puglia. Um, and then we, you know, uh, Italy... Uh, the government of Italy, the, I forget which ministry it is, but the one, one, that, one that helps with exports invited us to go to London to imbibe at the Italian Pavilion, um, which was fantastic, right? I mean, we're, we're a startup vodka brand, and they're like, we, you, we, want, we, want, want, we want you in our, in our pavilion. And we pick up an, a UK importer from that. And then, you know, we get these folks in India, and then the, chamber, the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Japan is saying, can you come over here? So we're going much faster in many more places than I ever thought we would, or I think Steve even, you know, either one of us thought we would, um, which is fantastic. I will say we're, we're a little bit over our skis on it because we're learning all of the ins and outs of distribution and importing and, and such. But, you know, the story's real, which is fun, right? It's not contrived. And the vodka's really good. We, you know, we've won three gold medals so far, just a double gold. We went gold for smooth. Um, so, you know, it's been well received as a product. So, we're going faster than I think I, I, either one of us ever thought we would. Well, it's it's like a marketer's dream when you say it's the story that caught everyone. It, you it know? really is. You're it so right. Uh, definitely all those years marketing, <laughs> you tapped into a, a real story that people wanted to hear. And from that, you've created this amazing liquid. Now, um, when you inv when you had that lunch party, had I assume that you had told these all these bartenders around Italy about what was going on? Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you the story. It, so we we <laughs> oh, we good. we reach out to these bar. You know, we 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 made lots of friends in the in the hospitality and tourism business here in the time we were here, and they helped up connect us. And so you know, we 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 get connected with these folks, and we tell them the story. Would you help us launch? And everybody everybody's just yeah, sure, let's do it. But we have to get them the vodka so they can come up with their with their their cocktail and the party's on a thursday night and we say no matter what we're going to get you the vodka by the friday before so you have the weekend to work on it and of course it's late but. it gets to the bonded warehouse in below outside of bologna late and they say oh there's no way we can get this ship before the weekend they're going to get it early next week and we're like no that can't work so um i do marketing videos my videographers uh from south america but he dated somebody in London, moved there, and then they relocated to Bologna. So he's now in Bologna at this time, even though when we first met, he's in South America. So I, his name is Mariano. I'm like, Mario, I, I think I'm going to need your help. And then, and then Steve finds somebody here in Puglia to help us too. So I'm gonna, I'll do this because it's fun and it's fast. So we send Francesco on an overnight train to Bologna. We get a car to pick him up from Bologna to go to Cesena to pick up three boxes of the vodka. He goes back to Bologna where Mariano meets him. He gives Mariano two bottles of vodka. Mariano gets on a train to Milan to bring it to Stefano Aise at Botanical Club. Francesco gets on a train to Rome where we have a messenger meet him in the train station in Rome to grab two bottles to take it to Drink Kong because he's got to stay on the train to come down to Bari where we then have a ta two taxis meet him, one to take the, the, the samples to the restaurant, the club in Bari, um, speakeasy, um, uh, and, and then the other to come meet Steve and me in, in Ostuni, 
where we are seeing our vodka for the first time, <laughs> we get it and we get samples for the head bartender at uh, Leo at the uh, at the hotel Paragon Seven Hundred. We're holding launch, and the cab keeps going down the Leche to drop off the last two bottles. So it literally it was planes, trains, automobiles on a Friday to get bottles all over Italy so we could keep our commitment to the bartenders <laughs> so they'd have it for the weekend. That really was the whole. That's the whole story of the distillery in one day. <laughs> Uh, it's like the Fellini yes, movies you love. Uh, movie, absolutely. And, and at the same time, you know, we'd obviously tasted it. But when you actually hold the bottle filled with the liquid mm -hmm. for the first time, and you're now actually drinking the production. So that same night with all of this madness going on, we get to taste our vodka for the first time. It, like, it's probably one of the most memorable days of my life. And it would always be one of the most memorable, memorable days of, of my life because of everything that happened that day. And that it all worked yes. out. Yes. <laughs> a miracle, I think. Right? A miracle. An Italian miracle. <laughs> e vero. <laughs> e vero. Now, we met at um, Venice Cocktail Week. So I thought it would be nice to say how you got involved in Venice Cocktail Week and um, how, how, how it went for you there. Sure. And again, you know, it's friends and friends. Um, so... Annalisa Testa, who is a, a, a real cocktail aficionado, she runs Como Cocktail Week and also, also uh, is a writer. She, through a friend, came to our opening um, and you know, loved the vodka, loved our story. She said, you have to come to Como Cocktail Week. So sure, so we do Como Cocktail Week. And as we're going through that, she says, you need to meet my really good friend, Paola, who runs Venice Cocktail Week. I think you need to be there, too. Um, so Paula and I start talking, then Paula's at uh, Como Cocktail Week. We meet in person, and uh, you know, there aren't too many blue-haired people in the universe, so we, <laughs> like, you're in my tribe, obviously. <laughs> so we, we hit it off, and actually that's when the same event is when I met the guys from Maybe Sammy. We were all in Como together. And, um, and you know, I, was, I love Venice. It's hard not to love Venice. And, and she's like, we, you'll be the only vodka. And I'm like, okay, that's amazing that we could go to Venice Cocktail Week and be an Italian vodka and the only vodka that is going to be one of the main sponsors of, 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 the, of the week. And, and that's how we wound up going there. We didn't even know about it till we you know, met Annalisa and, and got invited to Como Cocktail Week. Um, it, it was an epic event for us. I, I, I can't say enough about how Venice welcomed us. Um, and the venues that welcomed us. I mean, you know, the Amman, the Experimental, the Colton Rooftop, the JW Marriott. I mean, it was, it was, over, it was a bit overwhelming, you know, the American Bar, Tonosca's American Bar. It's just a bit over Cafe Fenice, um, Gennaro there with the Merchant of Venice cocktail. I mean, it was so much fun seeing the, the enthusiasm uh, that the product was greeted with. And they're like, okay, it's a really good Italian vodka. And the, and the way we were kind of, you know, big bear hugs and welcomed, and welcomed into so many venues. And like, you know, they're now permanent customers. Lorenzo De Cola at Experimental is, is like, a, you know, a, a, one of our biggest fans and advocates. It's just, it was such a, the whole thing was an amazing experience. You know, having the guys from maybe Sammy come up and be at the Amman with us. I, I couldn't, I can't say enough about Paola about Venice Cocktail Week, about how well run it was and how fantastic all of the venues were in, in welcoming us. I, I did or that. It, it's, it's great. It's a great event. Um, it's fabulous. Now, you mentioned, well, you're wearing a T-shirt <laughs> of a new spirit that you've created or are creating. Yeah. So tell me about the gym. Sure. So, um, you know, we say our, our tagline from the distillery is just all about the wheat. Um, and so, you know, what we, we, we kind of say our mission is to take the wheat and express it in all the formats that you could drink it. Um, and so gin is the next logical one. Um, so we're, we actually are producing the gin right now. We're, we're final, you know, you, you, get your, you get your recipe and then you put it in real production and you refine it and taste it. So we're in the process of doing that. I, I think we'll be in bottle by December. The first gin is uh -huh. a very, very classic London dry. Italy's got a lot of gins. They're really effusive with their botanicals. Um, most of them are actually compound gins where a lot of the botan botanicals added after the distillation, not before. Mm -hmm. And they can make a lovely single drink because they're so strong in their flavor. They're, they tend to be really lovely in a, a particular cocktail or a particular concoction or with, a, with something else, but not really classic gins. And we, for our first gin, wanted to set out to really respect the tradition of, the, of gin with the classic London dry, but also express the wheat. And so I've tasted it pretty fantastic. Um, I, it, 
we, we, I, I gave it to a bunch of non gin drinkers who drank it neat at room temperature and said, I would never drink gin cold. Yet I can drink this because the one thing I should say is uh, the word the, the Italians use in describing the vodka and, and now the gin is morbida. Um, the Durham wheat gives it a really creamy finish um, that's very smooth. And even though we're 43% ABV, it doesn't come across as hot. The gin has that. So it's got a very classic London dry front to it with the juniper and the, that little bit of little bit of spice to it. But it finishes really smooth and creamy. So it, it still reflects and respects the wheat. So I'm really excited to get it out there because it won't be like most Italian gins today. There's certainly some very top shelf Italian gins that really respect the tradition. But I, I think most Italian gins are tend to be more perfumey and botanical than a classic gin. Mm -hmm. And the botanicals that you're using, um, have a lot of them been local or have you used any a, a lot of them, but not all of them in the London Dry, particularly because we wanted to respect London Dry. And so okay. Italy, now Juniper, no problem. This is the land of Juniper. <laughs> so, so the main one, we, we source local, no problem. But, uh, to really respect the typical botanical mix of London Dry, you couldn't source everything in Italy. And that was, to me, more important okay. um, that we respect London Dry. Now, the second gin, which will come out early next year, like late first quarter, I love a Negroni. And there's kind of, I think, different schools of thought. First of all, I love the story of a Negroni, right? Count Negroni says Americanos are for weaklings. Where's the alcohol in this ad? Right. And so if you think about that as his intent, getting inside the mythical Count Negroni's mind, the gin wasn't put there to add flavor. The gin was only put there to add 40% more, more vodka, I'm mean, sorry, alcohol to the drink, right? He wanted to jack up the alcohol content. Right. So I think it's particularly Juniper and Campari can clash. I think they're two very strong and a bit bitter alkaline flavors. And so to me, a, a gin should play a supporting role in a Negroni to the two big flavors, which are the Vermouth and the Campari. Um, and so... Carlos and I are, are finishing working a recipe that is meant to support the flavors of the Campari, not fight fight it. So to me, that's less juniper, more burnt orange flavor, more green like basil, flavors that will not try to take over the drink from the Campari, the vermouth, but support them. So that one will be all Italian botanicals because we're, we're not trying to respect but the dry tradition. We're trying to come up with one that honestly is less junipery and more, more subtle botanicals. Um, but will really be built for the Negroni. And I'm probably going against myself into kind of maybe a single-use jit, but given how popular the Negronis are, I'm okay with that. Now, now remind me, how long ago did you move to Italy? <laughs> One year and four months, I think, maybe five. Well, five. One year and five months. <laughs> and if you asked yourself three years ago or whenever you decided, would you be in the spirit industry, what would your answer have been? Hell no. And honestly, honestly, Susan, there are days you wake up here and go, what are you doing? <laughs> this is insane. Um, you know, at, at some point, actions take over for thinking and, and you, you're, all, you're kind of watching yourself do stuff. So there are still those moments where I think both Steve and I say, wow, what are we doing? But then you just you take a deep breath and go, well, we're, it's too late now. Let's just go. And it sounds like you're having a really good time with it. I, you know, I'd lie if I didn't say there were days that this is not an amazingly frustrating endeavor, but those are the those are the fewer days, and the most days are days of enormous grace where you meet. I, I, we talked about it in advance. This business is filled with really giving people, right? The the hospitality business is based on the idea of hospitality, and the people that work in it, I think, have their heart in that that mindset, and so. Most of the pe most of the time, you're working with just such lovely people who want you to be successful. That's the only thing I really known about this business is that there's of course competition but the competition is almost secondary the desire to have more people be successful because it raises the whole business and bringing quality products into the business that bars can use you know take a spirit and, and express it in a slightly different format there's a mindset i think that it just makes everybody better so it's a really fun rewarding business to be in um and that is by far the the you know the the, the predominant experience and the other thing for I say this all the time. I think Steve would say it, but I say it. It's been most of my life marketing and being in marketing and technology, which is air. And there's nothing like holding your own product. There's just nothing like holding a bottle with vodka that you produced and pouring it for a friend, pouring it for a bartender, you're exposing it to the first time and saying, I made this. It's a, it's a very 
visceral personal experience that that I've never had before in my life. So it's extremely rewarding. Uh, it it is, and I totally agree with you about um, this business and the, the hospitality business being so hospitable. I agree completely. Absolutely. Now, before you go, I always ask two questions. And since now you are, I don't know if you were a home bartender before you started this, but as a home bartender, do you have any tips that you can give anyone listening? Yeah, so yeah, I'd say a couple of things, right? Experiment. It, 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 making great cocktails is like cooking. I think that's why it makes sense to me, right? Flavors go together. And, and if you think of cocktails in the terms of flavor, um, it really helps you just be, have fun with it. So I, I'll give you an example. Um, so Marcel, I think you met Marcel when we were in, in Venice. He's our he's our, our hospitologist. Yeah. We went out to dinner. And went, um, I'll only think I'll think of the place, and we had a great time. And we're we're, we're a big group, about a dozen of us, and we're having a great time with uh, with our waiter, our captain, and, and and Marcel asked for a little. Do you have some chili oil for some of the fish we're on? And the the owner of the restaurant brings over a bottle, and he said, "I made this myself here." And of course, we all loved it. He goes, "You guys keep it. I want you to have it as a gift." And from that, and from a cocktail that we had at the experimental, um, Lorenzo came up with something called a vodka dyer, where he used horseradish and Lorenzo uh, and uh, Marcel and I both like heat. Marcel looks at me and says, "What if we use this chili oil as a source of heat in a version of our of our martini instead of instead of um, using horseradish? It'd be more a more Italian flavor profile." And so we we he played with it. We upped the vermouth a little bit to counteract the chili, so it wasn't so hot. And it was this beautiful martini that had a little bit of back heat to it, but offset by the sweet of the mood and the earthiness of the vodka, it was just delicious. And it like to me, it's like cooking. It's like, okay, we, we just came up with a recipe. So I always say to my friends, it's okay to play, right? It, you, you, nobody's going to get mad at you for making them a cocktail, right? We, we'll drink it and say maybe you got another one. So one to me is, is, is experiment. But two, and two is learn a little bit about the history of cocktails because the reason we like things we like today is rooted in, right, Henry Craddock's cocktail books from the Savoy in the 20s and um, Ada and the Hanky Panky, right? I mean, there, there are great, there are people who already figured out some good basics. So if you, if you really want to be a home bartender, take a little time, get yourself a classic cocktail book, read a few recipes and why they came up and why somebody came up with them, and then riff on them. And you can have so much fun by, by mixing tradition and innovation in your own house and just have fun. Fabulous. Now, the last question. If you could be anywhere drinking anything, where would that be and what would it be? Wow. That, uh, you know, uh, this one is the toughest question in the world um, because there are so many amazing places to, to be drinking something. But um, uh, I, I, I am, I'm a Fellini romantic, so we would be at the Grand Hotel in Rimini uh, drinking a Negroni. Uh, and, and and then afterwards eating capoletti and brodo, which is one of his favorite dishes, just because for me, that's like a a, a, chill, a shuddering moment of la dolce vita, it, it just isolated in a, in a just a, a moment of time, and, and and that's the source of it for me. Oh, that's very romantic. I love that. Well, I want to thank you so much for spending all this time with me, and I love meeting you. I love meeting you. I'm love having you as my friend now and uh, a bottle behind me that I can open yeah, and cheers. drink and I cannot wait for the gin. Absolutely. And I'll see you in London soon for sure. Absolutely. Thanks again. Cheers. Cheers.